Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of the TFG1 podcast, recorded on April 24th, 2009. I am your host, Michael Blanchard, with a special guest co-host, Michael Wilson. Hello, Michael. Hi, it's not actually April 24th, it's actually... Yes, we know it's not actually... Yeah, but that's when it's the record dates are. So, oh, we recorded on the 24th. Yes. You know what I mean? It's published on the 24th. Yeah. No. What? Yeah. Both. Fantastic. We, we record them early, but we post da- we post date them. <laughs> you want to <laughs> okay. try it again? Uh, no, we're just gonna leave this the way it is. Stop. You can you can edit it, right? Hello, this is Michael Blanchard back with you again on the TFG1 podcast. I uh, am tired of doing these by myself, so I have my co-host with me who is a podcast newbie, and he is kind of raw, so just kind of bear with us. His name is Michael Wilson. Hello, Mike. Hi there. Now, what do you prefer, Michael, Mike? I go by Michael. Okay. All right. Um, so why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, like what kind of Transformers fan you are, and like what's your favorite shows out of the out of the the fandom and all that stuff. Oh, okay. I I dig it all. You know, <laughs> I, I I collect pretty much everything. I have an extensive collection, uh, probably more than than most people that I know of, and and there's a lot of people out there that I know that have a, a large collection. Yeah, yours is by far the biggest I have ever seen. <laughs> I have, I have thousands. Yeah, you, that, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> you, you can almost have millions. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, I but, but yeah, there, there's a lot of them, and uh, you know, I, I recognize it's a sickness. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's something wrong with me, very, very wrong with me, and and I, I have way too many transformers. But on on the other side, it's the only thing I collect. Uh, you know, I don't have like the GI Joe and the He Man and and the Indiana Jones. It's just Transformers. Well, that's cool. That's good. I mean, you know, and it's always good to be down with the sickness. <laughs> that's right. I'm insane in the memory. Let, 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 yeah, let, let, let's yeah. see if people can get that reference. Let's not say what it's from. But let's see if people can get that down with the sickness reference. Of course, most people that listen will. Yeah, go uh, back and watch Dawn of the Dead. It's it's on the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to. I was tired of just having um, myself drone on. Even though I love Generation One and I love rewatching these cartoons, I just wanted someone you know to kind of bounce off of, and you know just have somebody you know here with me doing it. And unfortunately, Steve slash Megatron. Uh, could not do... Actually, he didn't want to do episode 14. He didn't like a uh, majority of the episodes that we're going to be reviewing today. Shocking. <laughs> these are some of the best episodes. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, the uh, There hasn't been any real email from as far as feedback. Um, you can always go over to the PredaconEmpire.com forums and join there. Uh, and there's tons of TFG1 stuff there. Um really isn't anything going on with me so far. Um, what's been going on with you, Michael? Uh, well, I just got a, a Briscoe in the mail from Thailand, and I was very excited. Uh, Briscoe being the head for Fangry. He's one of the uh, junior headmasters in Decepticon. Oh. And this guy's been sitting on my shelf for about three years without a head. <laughs> and I finally got one, so that's kind of exciting. Briscoe County Robot Head. Briscoe, yeah, that's right. His, it's uh, <laughs> it's Bruce Campbell sitting on top of the giant robot. Oh my god! Yeah, with the big chin, <laughs> he says, "My name is Bruce." Ah, uh, big chin, huh? That reminds me of Sentinel Prime. <laughs> 
I think Sentinel Prime's chin was based on Bruce Campbell. <laughs> probably. He, he's, he's only missing the chainsaw arm, and he'd have it all. You, you know, it would probably be beneficial to animate it if Bruce Campbell actually voiced Sentinel, Sentinel Prime. <laughs> oh, you know, that would, that would just piss off all the Tick fans. <laughs> but, uh, but I, no, I do think uh, Bruce Campbell would be an awesome voice for... You know, we should talk to Derek White about that and say, dude, Bruce yeah. Campbell, think about it. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> We need Bruce Campbell on t- on animated saying "Hail to the King, baby." That's what yeah, we that, need. Uh, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Um, actually, <laughs> my only Bruce Campbell watching has been from the Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Oh, you're not an Evil Dead fan? Mm, I'm not a horror fan, so dude, you are missing out. I, I don't I don't do horror. No, no, no. <laughs> my mom made me watch uh, Fr- uh, uh, Freddy when I was like five years old, and that scarred me for life. Oh, man. Yeah, so I do not do horror. Um, well, you got anything else to say that you want to say, Michael? Uh, no, that, that pretty much wraps it up. That was my excitement for the day. All right, we're going to get into some episodes today. Astro Train, look out for those asteroids! Well, fry my heat shield. Get a look on that, Pitchfleet, the Autobot symbol. In this part of the galaxy, our sensors show no sign of life. Exercise caution. They may be deceiving our sensors. It sure looks like a ghost planet. Too bad I was looking forward to blasting a few Autobots. It's not like the Autobots to leave a whole city to decay. It's covered with inscriptions. Too bad none of us reads Ancient Autobot. Starscream, keep your grubby fingers off that. It could be a booby trap. What trap? This is a prehistoric communication device, you uneducated dolt! If Cybertron be your home, far away, never roam. Hear my message, listen and fear. Danger comes, the end is near. Just like us, you soon will rust. All shall be turned to dust. (sighs) What is this on my chest hole? It looks like some sort of rust. That is ridiculous. We are rust-proof. Placing my chest won't be enough. (sighs) Nor will your minimal knowledge. I need an expert. Order the Stunticons to seize Perceptor and bring him to me! Do as I say! (laughs) Yahoo! Come on, Aerial Bots! We're gonna spray old Lady Liberty! That non-functioning old robot? She's no robot! She's a hollow statue the Earth humans constructed! This is a mutiny. No, no, a hijack. I mean, we're taking over this boat. Snap to it, everybody, and in a captain's cabin. Coral Stop will keep the Statue of Liberty safe from acid rain or anything else that's harmful. How did you ever come up with the formula, Perceptor? I must apologize, but I am unable to reveal anything about the compound. Hey, fellows! Catch this wild action! Ah! Hey, who do you think you're A stunticon! You got it! And here's greetings from Megatron! I'm trapped! You can say that again! (laughs) 
Welcome, <coughs> Perceptor. Please, dispense with the formalities. You are my mortal enemy, and... <sighs> you have a unique opportunity, Perceptor, to gain peace in return for a favor. What sort of favor? Solve this little problem of mine. <coughs> If you're serious about peace, Megatron, then begin by surrendering your new weapon. If you cure me, the weapon is yours. Very well. Hmm. You've been infected by a metallic plague, Megatron. Impossible! Only organic forms of life can be infected by disease. This is a rare metallic infection. Legend has it, it wiped out entire races of robots, like the Black Plague did to humans. It's Cosmic Rust. First up today, we have Cosmic Rust. And according to the little booklet that comes with the DVD, the little blurb in there says, Astro Train inadvertently infects Megatron with an ancient rusting disease that he picked up on a mission to deep space, Megatron kidnaps Perceptor, forcing the Autobot scientist to cure him with a new chemical the Autobots created to prevent corrosion. Um, and the first bullet point, first couple bullet points I have for this uh, episode are, uh, as I just said, to begin the episode, Megatron and a bunch of the Decepticons are traveling an astro train to a distant planet. This planet has a giant Autobot symbol on it. Can you be any more obvious? <laughs> you can see it from space! Exactly. I mean, this thing is almost half... It, it takes up half that side of the planet. Uh, and they land, and there's no electricity. And it's like, how did they light up a giant Autobot signal the size of a continent? How does that work? It's just weird. I mean, is it like Jupiter? I mean, do you have a giant Autobot insignia-shaped uh, storm that spins continuously on the planet? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But, you know, I, I, for plot purposes, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Yep. The Decepticons are very leery of being on the planet. Starscream finds a communications device and activates a message from an ancient Autobot. Uh, okay, didn't you have something to say about that? Didn't you tell me something off air about when Starscream goes over to the control panel? Doesn't he start humping it or something? <laughs> no, he doesn't hump the control panel. He humps the lightning. Oh. Bug. He oh, finds that lightning that's right. bug and he's like, I'm just going to fuck this lightning. <laughs> he's, he's like, you know, it's been a while, and we're not going to discover female Autobots for a while, so I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to bang the hell out of this lightning bug. Uh, the ancient Autobot, though, he does, he's, you know, kind of cryptic. Yeah, as, very cryptic. As far as what he says, but you would think that, you know, it, they would get the hint. Let's get the hell out of here. I don't think we should be here. It's, yeah, I think really. it's supposed to be scary. Kinda, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, with season two coming to a close. Um, oh, yeah, I should have mentioned in the uh, in the intro that we are reviewing the final five episodes of season two. So, um, yeah, with these final five episodes, um, everything started getting a little bit more scarier and a little bit more spacier uh, before the movie. Uh, let's see, but I digress, actually. They find a lightning bug weapon and steal it as Astro Train leaves the planet and Asteroid is coming up behind them, and Megatron shoots the lightning bug weapon at it, shattering it. Two pieces of the asteroid hit Astro Train and Megatron. Um, you're not supposed to shoot a giant-ass lightning weapon at a giant-ass asteroid, knowing that it's going to split into two pieces. Well, in his defense, he didn't really know that. Well, I mean, if you, if, you, if you think, I'm going to shoot this and it's going to explode in the shrapnel and perforate me, then you probably wouldn't shoot it. But the question becomes, why the hell is there an asteroid following them? Is it a sentient asteroid? Is the, is the cosmic I, rust sometimes... I think it is. I think that's part of the plot point. The, the it's an intelligent that, asteroid that chases them? Well, no, not, not that it's an intelligent asteroid that chases them. The fact that um, the cosmic rust is on the asteroid... And I believe it does get on Astro Train, but I'm not for sure. Yeah, it looked to me like the only one who was really infected was Megatron. It was and, Megatron and he was yeah. having a rough time of it. They barely get back to Earth, and Megatron demands that the Stunticons kidnap Perceptor to analyze the disease Megatron has. 
Receptor tells the evildoer, yes, I said evildoer, that he has been infected with metallic plague called Cosmic Rust. Okay, yeah. Perceptor realizes that Megatron's lightning bug heat ray is the energy source that the Cosmic Rust germs are feeding off of. Perceptor says that they should destroy it before he cures Megatron. What are you laughing at? No, I, I'm just thinking... He's, he's like, well, that's my new weapon. I'm not letting you destroy my new weapon. It's like, dude, you have other weapons. <laughs> you, know? you got, you, you have the, uh, the fusion cannon on your arm. The, the, you know, pretty much powered by, uh, black hole. That's that's pretty powerful in and of itself. I don't see why you just don't use that. You don't really need the giant bug, you know. Aside to, uh, aside from, you know, placating Starscream's hormonal urges. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> Starscream wow. needs it, man. He's sitting up all night with it. Wow. Ah, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> it's fine. It may, it, it, but no, he's very for, protective it of good it. good entertainment. He's yeah, like, exactly. you know what? No, you can't have it. No, it's mine. It's mine. It's it's like, it's it, yeah. It makes me wonder exactly. Yeah, the, is there an ulterior motive there? Is there something else he's planning? But they never really get into that in these, uh, these mm. episodes. Well, you know, G1 Megatron is not the smartest... Uh, cookie in the in the box um however the leader isn't thrilled at this perceptor gives the leader the chorus stop that he and the other autobots have created megatron and the other decepticons are about to be cured cosmos is flying through space and he radios blaster to tell him that there is no more ant- antibodies to make this chorus stop anywhere in the known universe I do remember this. You were talking to me about this off air. It wasn't Perceptor. It was Cosmos. It was Cosmos. He said, and I remember Cosmos saying antibody. He said ingredient X. No, he didn't. He did. He didn't. Dude, I'm still gonna play it for you. No, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> I'll, I'll you play too. it. I'll play it back later, and I will. You know, right. I'll, right. I'll 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 recant myself. But he said antibody. He said, yeah, he actually says there's no more ingredient X. Whatever. And uh, you know, and everyone, well. You know, Blaster's like, well, perhaps not going to like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, to digress, back when you have Megatron, he and he says, oh, I'm not feeling very good. Perceptor says, here, try some of this. And he just pulls it out of nowhere. I mean, I'm sure he's, he's got it stuck in subspace or in his ass or somewhere. But uh, <laughs> the, the last of the stuff available, uh, they don't have any more. They can't make any more. And he says, oh, here, have some of this and, and rub it on your, on your head and your body and such. Mm-hmm. And then he becomes all nice and shiny. I do like the fact when Megatron is infected that I believe it was either Soundwave or Starscream tries to uh, hold his hand and his fucking hand just falls right off. <laughs> I love that. No, he, he, ha- he was just, I don't know if he was shaking his hand at Perceptor, but the hand fell off and Perceptor, like an idiot, picks it up. It's, oh, see, I thought somebody was trying to hold his hand and it fell off. No, Perceptor picks it up and he looks at it, and it's like, dude, you know this stuff is covered in flesh-eating zombie z- germs, you know, and you pick <laughs> it up with your bare hands. I, I, I'd i be looking around for some salad tongs or something to pick up the, the, the nasty, gross, deteriorated, severed hand of Megatron so that I wouldn't get it all over myself. And what do you know? In the next scene, what happens? He's tied to a bomb covered in the shit. <laughs> it's your um, fault. You should have been playing with it. <laughs> yeah. Then the aerial bots, who I didn't think were in this episode at first, are filling in Optimus Prime on what they found by following Blitzwing in an attempt to rescue Perceptor. When Megatron contacts Optimus Prime and tells him that he is giving Perceptor back, but at noon, the bomb attached at the end of his microscope will blow him to bits. That was genius. Yeah, it was. It's like, you know, I, I got this trap, and he's probably going to be dead by 12.15, so you better get there by noon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Um, when the Autobots get to Perceptor, Prime attempts to save him, but Perceptor tells him that, he is, that he'll be infected. Optimus saves Perceptor anyway and takes him back to the Autobot base. Teletran 1 finds out and explains where the cosmic rust germs come from. Teletran... Uh, then basically malfunctions because of Prime touching it. Ratchet and Blaster are infected too. But this is because Megatron is outside the base with the heat ray letting the Autobots suffer. See, they never actually clarify. Is it the energy from the bug, or is it the heat ray itself 
that's causing the spread of the disease. Well, Perceptor said it was the energy f- emitting from the bug. Right. So it, you would think it, that the best way to make them suffer would be to move the bug inside. <laughs> Which, <laughs> here's my ultimate weapon. Oh, by the way, don't stand too close to it. Kind of defeat the purpose, considering that he was willing to give up his own hand to, to keep the bug. But Yes. Um, let's see, what else, what was the, okay. At the Decepticon base, Megatron learns from Laserbeak that the Autobots will be saved if they can get some of the chorus stop off of the statue. Oh, that's why they didn't try to make more. They went to go scrape Lady Liberty's ass <laughs> to get some of the chorus stop off of it. That's well, what it was. They have the, the matter uh, <laughs> regenerator, or the matter duplicator. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if yeah. they can just get a little bit off of uh, Statue of Liberty, they can yep. they can make as much as they want, despite the fact that nobody seems to think this thing works. But that's uh, that's the giant yeah, plot exactly. hole. It's like, what does this matter replicator do? Could I possibly use it to create as much energy as I could possibly want? Oh no, it doesn't work that way. No, that would that would uh, kill off the entire premise of every episode. <laughs> The Autobots are already at the statue when the Decepticons get there, and the battle ensues. The Aerial Bots merge into Superion and destroy the Lightning Bug Heat Ray, forcing the Decepticons to retreat. The Autobots get the cure and uh, save the Statue of Liberty all at the same time, thus ending this episode. And we are going to stop here. Okay. Now for our thoughts on this episode... Um, as I mentioned in the synopsis, seeing what the cosmic rust did to Megatron was just funny, and it, he looks almost as bad as when Prime beats him down in the movie, and I know we haven't gotten to the movie yet, and we will in episode 16, but yeah. Uh, the cosmic rust effects were, uh, very unique and cool to see. I laughed so hard when Megatron's hand fell off. Uh, I think one of the more funny moments was when Blaster says he is too young to rust. <laughs> Technically, it's supposed to be impossible for any of them to rust. No. Which, is, you know, is what Megatron brings up in the, in the beginning. He's like, oh, I can't be rusting. And then, you know, his hand falls off. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on this episode? Well, there, there was a few neat, interesting moments there. Uh... Uh, one that I thought was funny was, you know, Perceptors is trying to get the the matter duplicator to work properly, and you know it, it's fading out. And I'm assuming because it's infected with the rust, and he just hauls off and kicks it, <laughs> just like a jukebox, just smack the hell out of it, and then pops up and says, "Oh, okay, I'll work now." Yeah, I thought that yep. was funny. And the uh, uh, toward the end, you know, the Decepticons are going to attack the Statue of Liberty to to destroy it so that the the Autobots can't get the core stop or can't get a sample of the core stop to, to duplicate. And, you know, they all kind of pop up from behind the limbs of, uh, of the statue. Which <laughs> I thought was funny. You have, you have Prime kind of hanging off the top of the top of the statue, right? dangling there shooting at Menasaur, which I thought was funny. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty uh, pretty funny. I, I, I predict this will happen in live-action version in the next Bay movie. <laughs> You'll have this awful, god awful, ugly Bayformer Optimus Prime hanging off the uh, the crown of the Statue of Liberty in in uh, Transformers Three. Wait well, for it. <laughs> ho- hopefully, hopefully Transformers Three will have somebody else directing it instead of fucking Bay. Oh no, wait, man, he he's got to be like Raimi. He's got to have that uh, trilogy. No, so, no, no. He only needs a he only needs the sequel. No, Jackson's got one. Raimi's got one. He's going for the trilogy. He's going for the hat trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> on to the next episode. You're a fool, Starscream, if you think that anyone will ever follow your orders. <laughs> Megatron exiled me. Me, Starscream. He made a fool out of me in front of the other Decepticons. They'll never respect me as a leader now. Uh, What the? Uh, A wing from an old fighter plane the flesh creatures used in their wars. There must be more of this stuff lying around here. This thing must be huge! 
reminds me of that two-faced loudmouth Blitzwing. Yes. If Megatron can have his Blitzwing, so can I. <laughs> me and what army? I'll show him what army. Up next is Starscream's Brigade, and according to the little booklet, Megatron can no longer stand Starscream's treachery and banishes the second in command to uh, Guadalcanal. That's what it is, Guadalcanal. They don't separate the words, so whatever. In the South Pacific, Starscream discovers that the remains of several World War II vehicles and decides to create his own team of loyal subjects, the Combaticons. And before we get into the synopsis, I must point out that the Combaticons were in, um, shit. They were in an episode of the cartoon that Steve and I talked about last episode. I forget which one it is exactly. If you want to find out which one it is, you can go back and listen to TFG1 Podcast episode 13. Now available on iTunes and ParticonEmpire.com. Uh, but yeah, it's a complete fuck-up as far as the um, the continuity. Um, oh, I didn't remember which one it was. It was Aerial Assault. Uh, anyway, but... So he appeared, or did they... The Combaticons. Mention? All of the Combaticons. Blastoff, Swindle, all of them appeared in Aerial Assault before they were even ever built in this episode. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Yes. So, we start this episode off in the Guadalcanal. In 1943, where World War II is going on, and we see... In black and white. Yes, the, yes, that was very, very cool. Nice touch. Yep. We see an amazing aerial battle and fighting going on. Then it fast-forwards through time to 1985 at the same location. The Decepticon stronghold... At the Decepticon stronghold, Starscream is running off at the mouth, as usual, uh, about how he could be a better leader than Megatron. Um, I've said this plenty of times before in past episodes. I am so sick and tired of the Megatron Starscream power struggle. I am, like, so (laughs) sick of it. First of all, I want to just shoot fucking Starscream and get it out of the way. Second of all, I want to shoot Megatron in the motherfucking foot because he is so (laughs) stupid he just doesn't... He just... Why doesn't he just shoot the... the, Gah! (laughs) <laughs> well, it's it's part of the uh, you know the dynamic of the two characters that they you know they, they they feed off of each other. Yeah, I know, but it's frustrating. <laughs> that and it makes for good TV. Fucking frustrating. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true too. Uh, the Decepticon leader turns his back on Starscream, and the sniveling bot fires upon the leader, sending him crashing to the ground. Starscream declares victory, but Megatron is not beaten so easily. I did laugh my ass off at this. <laughs> because then Megatron returns fire on Starscream, temporarily deactivating him. Megatron then tells Soundwave to have Laserbeak get Starscream out of his sight. The Birdbot flies over the island where the, rem- the remnants of the World War II battles took place and drops Starscream. Uh, Starscream, uh, comes to realizing that Megatron has exiled him and he finds all the old battle equipment from World War II. Starscream builds his own army of bots. Um, it really shows off his scientist stuff in this, um, as far as... Oh, the fact, the fact that he was a scientist yeah. and he, he has the know-how to do this type of thing? Mm-hmm. What drives me crazy is, you know, he puts all these pieces together out of, uh, you know, old, old parts and... You know, he's got an uh, an old plane, and the plane actually turns into a helicopter. And it made me think, didn't they have helicopters in World War Two? Maybe they maybe they didn't. I don't think they did. Okay, yeah. So they didn't actually have helicopters in World War Two, but at the same time, they didn't have space shuttles either. <laughs> so you have the, these old rusted out vehicles that kind of turn into. Well, I mean, if they start off as authentic World War Two vehicles. They kind of turn into modern vehicles. Yep. In a sense that, well, how cool would it be if you had a World War II Bruticus? Yeah. That was literally made out of, and I'm, well, wait a minute, Vortex is, yeah. I mean, if they actually had, like, Vortex was, you know, uh, an, an old an old uh, World War II level fighter plane. And, uh, um, oh, 
that kills me. I just forgot his name. Um, What's the leader's name? I, I don't know, but I really can't talk too much about Vortex because. Uh, oh, Onslaught. Yeah, oh, so, well, Onslaught. Well, but I mean, as far as Onslaught, Onslaught was a half track, uh, and it turns from an from he was from becoming a World War Two level half track into uh, you know the the semi truck with a with the guns on the back, and you know it'd be it would be really cool if we had. Uh, World War II vehicles yeah. that were, um, that you know, were Combaticons. Yeah, that, that would be kind of cool. Um, they did something very similar in the comic books. Yeah. But so we won't get into that here. Uh, uh, he then goes to the space... <laughs> Starscream then goes... What? I said I'm rambling. Well, stop rambling, <laughs> damn it. It's not... I'm sorry. I, I told you about this all week long that one night we were going to record, and I even asked you this morning when you were at work and sober if you, we were going to record tonight, and you said yes. And you let, your, yeah. and you let yeah. your wife talk you into drinking and, and getting drunk, and yeah, before you... There, there was no drunkenness involved. Hey, man, I'm a grown man. I know my limits. Oh, I know. I'm talking to some little college kid here who... Uh, oh, no, I know. To the point of... Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just ragging <laughs> on you, hell. I know. All right. We're just then, playing. Starscream then goes to the Space Bridge location and demands to be allowed to use it. On Cybertron, Starscream gets the personality chips of several renegade Decepticons uh, that Megatron had imprisoned. Starscream will implant these personalities into bots the bots he has built. He puts the personality chips into the vehicle modes and tells them to transform. Um, first of all, it was already established that Vector Sigma is the only one that can grant personalities in life. Now, I understand that these personality chips were from different uh, actual molds or bodies, but I, I don't know. That, that that was just weird to me. I don't think they actually established that part of the mythos yet. I mean, the idea that Vector Sigma can bestow a spark uh, upon yes, the, a... Yes, they uh, did. Uh, yeah, well, I, did they did they already? Yep. Um, I thought that I thought that came later, nope. like post movie. Nope, it was um, the key to Vector Sigma. <laughs> it, was the, it was that two parter. Uh, yep. Well, as far as where the, you know, where the aerial bots and the, to... and the comba- and the uh, stunticons were uh, created. See, now I had always you know retcon post rationalized it to say uh, that these personality chips were kind of like a spark chamber. And that you could, you know, pull the personality out of a robot just by yanking the spark chamber uh, out of it. Yeah. And you could store it indefinitely. The spark never dies. Yeah, I, yeah, I could see that. Um, let's. But I don't think that, that that idea had been established that far back. No, he, I don't think it had either. Uh, Starscream has created the Combaticons, Brawl, Swindle, Blastoff, Vortex, and Onslaught. Starscream wants them to follow him in dethroning Megatron, but the Combaticons ask what's stopping them from pounding Starscream into a pile of dirt. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Actually, I was reading that. It, lo- it looked like a deflowering Megatron. No, it's, like, it's you know, dethroning. Megatron, <laughs> Megatron looks nothing like a giant metal bug. So, you know, <laughs> you don't, he's already kicked your ass once this episode. You don't want to try that shit on him. <laughs> Uh, to which the evildoer replies that he hasn't equipped them with energy absorbers so they can't refuel. At a dedication ceremony to Optimus Prime, Jazz and Cliffjumper are there to cut the ribbon when Starscream and his army attacks them, kidnapping Jazz and Cliffjumper. <sighs> with the intention of stealing their... Their energy absorbers. Energy absorbers. absorbers. Yes. Um, first of all, Jazz has a kick-ass sound system that no one can stand except for him and Spike. Why the hell didn't he just friggin' transform and blare the music? Uh, they, they had their asses handed to them yes, pretty they, handily, but I think that, that was the point. Yeah, it was. They, they wanted to show that these guys, you know, these new Combaticons are pretty powerful, yep. and they can take on uh, seasoned veterans oh, like yeah. uh, Jazz and Cliffjumper. Yep. At the island, the Combaticons and Starscream celebrate the victory, but the Combaticons start to argue, and Starscream tells them that there will be no energy absorbers for any of them until they can capture three more Transformers. So clearly, Starscream doesn't care which faction of Transformer he captures to uh, to put the energy absorbers into the Combaticons. Yeah, he's kind of... 
uh, equal opportunity. I want to screw everybody. Basically, over yeah. At this point, yeah, he's he's pretty much pissed at the world. Yeah. Shockwave contacts Megatron and informs him that the Renegade Decepticons have been liberated. Megatron assumes that the Autobots did it, and he heads to their base to get back what is his. Megatron, Skywarp, Dirge, and Thrust attack the Autobots, and Megatron demands that the Autobots give back the personalities of the Renegade Decepticons. I'm going to continue with this with the second one because it would make more sense. The the next bullet point. Yeah. Optimus Prime demands that the Decepticons give back Jazz and Cliffjumper. Megatron has no idea what Prime is talking about and realizes that maybe it wasn't the Autobots that stole the personalities. Megatron and the other Decepticons are waiting for Starscream at a train yard when the sniveling bot shows up and introduces his army, the Combaticons, and they are going to destroy Megatron. Um, how does it slip through Megatron and Shockwave? How does it slip through Shockwave that Starscream has gone to Cybertron, he has used the space bridge, which opens into the chamber that Shockwave is always in. Now, granted, Shockwave's probably out getting drunk on Energon or something like that. Yeah. He had to pee. Yeah, he had to pee. Yeah, yeah, he had to step out to yeah, pee. Yeah, he, 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 he had to do a Bumblebee oil leak from TFO7. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to leak on your head. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, that's, I need a government agent. I just got to pee on him. I need a Sector 7 agent. <laughs> now, what kills me, though, is that Starscream walks up to the space bridge and says, Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of going through. And the Thundercracker and Skywarp are there, and they're like, No, you're not. And he points the gun at his head and says, y- "Yeah, I am." Yeah. You know? At this point, why didn't they just redirect him deep into space? <laughs> Say, "Yeah, sure, have fun, and you're going to be trapped in the, uh, you know, the space bridge buffer until hell freezes now, over." See, that's the other thing that that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, the space bridge in G1, um, they don't actually. I mean, Shockwave when they first. When they first introduced the space bridge in in the first season, Shockwave says, you know, he, he it has to have a receiving code, it has to have this, it has to have that, it has to be precise timing. But every other episode after that with the space bridge, we're automatically supposed to assume that it is set to Cybertron, and that's exactly where whoever yeah. goes through is going to it. It doesn't mention anything about not concentrating anymore, about not you know whatever else. And it, yeah, at this point it's just an elevator. Yeah, pretty much. You push the button, it goes bing, and you walk in, yeah. and the door opens again, and there you are. Yep. And and assuming Shockwave's not taking a pee, <laughs> there he is too. Yes, exactly. Uh, stars. Okay, uh, okay, just for a minute. Uh, Starscream <laughs> is saved by Swindle, who fires upon Soundwave, but hits the light in the train yard. Oh yeah, he hits the lights in the train yard, going dark, allowing the others to escape. However, Dirge and Ramjet are injured, and uh, that brings the Absorber count to four. Um, you know what I don't understand is, you know, Swindle being Swindle. I'm really surprised he's not going over there with a wrench, <laughs> just ripping out energy <laughs> absorbers. It's like these are all mine now. <laughs> you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sell these to the to the nearest Transylvanian general. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'll see you later. I don't think. Um, Swindle has gotten his full personality yet, but that will come in season three when he tries yeah. to go up against Galvatron. That that was a bad idea. Um, uh, at the wa- <laughs> Gotta love yeah, that that was a really bad idea. <laughs> at the water and power plant, Starscream and the Combaticons are recharging when Megatron attacks. Megatron has the Constructicons merge into Devastator, but Starscream has prepared for this and tells the Combaticons to merge into Bruticus. Um. I'm trying to remember who was Bruticus's alter, like Autobot alter, because I've noticed something with the with all. I thought that was Defensor. Um, Bruticus Defensor. Yeah, you're right. The um. But you notice earlier in the episode, I think it was uh, Megatron says, "Hey, Sonicons, you know you got to show up for this," and they're like, "Screw you!" Yeah, man. exactly. Yeah, and that's uh, that's foresight because you know basically. You have the Constructicons who merge to form Devastator, and then Bruticus merges and promptly beats the snot out of Devastator. Uh, Devastator being the first and therefore the weakest of the combiners. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the the, the Sonicons 
don't show up until later. Yeah, they show up at the very end and save Megatron's ass. Uh, actually, that's the, that's the last <laughs> bullet point. The Stunticons <laughs> finally arrive to save Megatron from Bruticus. They unite to Menasaur, and after Menasaur attacks Bruticus, Megatron has Astrotrain banish Starscream and his army to a barren asteroid, <laughs> thus ending this episode. <laughs> Now for our thoughts on this episode. This was a pretty good episode. It gave us somewhat cl- uh, climactic end to the Starscream Megatron power struggle. The animation and sound was solid. As I've said many times before, the production on the show has gotten increasingly better over the first two seasons. Uh, I think I mentioned this in uh, the last episode of the podcast, as I said before. There's a major continuity flub. The Combaticons were in uh, were in an Aerobots episode before they were even built. Um, and then the only other notes I have is just what I already said in the synopsis about who the Combaticons are. Um, so, yeah, what are your thoughts, Michael? Uh, well, I mean, like I said earlier, the, the, these are the last five of Season 2 are some of my favorite episodes in Starstream's Brigade. And the following, you know, the, the follow-up, The Revenge of Bruticus, are probably two of my favorites. Uh, period. I, I really love the uh, the well. I want to say the Bruticus character, but the uh, not, there's not a whole lot of characterization there. He's just like I'm big and dumb. But I really like the toys, uh, the Bruticus mold, and uh, the following later on the Ruination mold are you know, some of my all-time favorites. Really dig those. So this is really a cool uh, you know cool idea, and it really uh, introduces some ideas that that are uh, they kind of make their way even further into the into the mythos. Does the Bruticus toy have the three spots on his back? <laughs> uh, you don't know. <laughs> we'll get into that more in the yeah. Revenge of Bruticus, but I mean, uh, he, yeah, that... he's got uh, he, he he well the twin cannons that ride on the back of the semi truck in, in vehicle mode. Those plug into his back, so technically he's only got two, you know, big dots, and that's or two holes, I should say, and that's where the the cannons plug in. I should probably uh... pull it out just to look, but no, I don't think they are there. Which is strange, you know, because I think in the cartoon, and again, this is the Revenge of Bruticus, but I think in the cartoon, they show the three spots, but they don't really show the the cannons, which I thought was strange. No, I don't, I don't think so either. Yeah, they conveniently Alrighty. remove them for that. <laughs> On to the next episode. Identify yourselves. Some refer to us as Combaticons, but. <laughs> I am also known as Bruticus. Destroy him! You control giant sentinels. If you destroyed, robots defeated. I must protect Cybertron from all hostile threats. <laughs> Bruticus outnumber, but Bruticus will win. Up next is The Revenge of Bruticus. To go to the little booklet, we have... Starscream abandons his team immediately following the events of Starscream's Brigade. But the Combaticons have their own ideas, such as taking over Cybertron and destroying Earth. And the Autobots' new merge group, the Protectobots, may not be enough to stop them. Uh, Let's see. Um, We begin this episode as Starscream and the Combaticons are still on the exiled asteroid. Starscream can no longer stand it, and he flies off into space. Blastoff is towing the asteroid to Cybertron, where Shockwave is testing the holographic imaging machine. Now, why I called it a holographic imaging machine instead of a projector, I don't know why. Maybe I, at the time, was not realizing how the hell to spell projector, but (laughs) I don't know. It makes holographs. Uh, I, I mean, I... Looking back on the asteroid... I, I understand that you know you have a lot of stuff to do and you can only cram it into a 22-minute you know, episode, but you know 
it almost seems like Starscream is there about 15 minutes, and he goes, screw you guys, I'm going home. And and then, al- almost immediately then, Blastoff begins towing the asteroid back to Cybertron. And, you know, didn't they confer a little bit and say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, Starscream says, I'm going to leave, and uh, you know, Blastoff says, well, I was going to tow us back to Cybertron, you sure you don't want to stick around? You know, because that would be cool too. And <laughs> no, I I think he was already towing it because it was moving. Oh, he was. Well, they got there. They got there pretty quick. Well, yeah, he got there pretty and, quick. But I mean, I think when the episode first starts off, um, they're already being towed. He he's already towing them. So oh. I I I just don't think they clued in uh, Starscream as to what where they were what going. They were doing exactly. Yeah, where they were yeah, going. that would make sense considering that Starscream can fly through space that he would be there yeah. towing as well. Yeah, really. <laughs> so you've got uh Shockwave there with his uh cone-headed minions <laughs> and they're 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 shooting at uh you know holographs or holograph holographic enemies flying around. Uh and it, it I I was kind of concerned as far as uh, why the drones look so bad. You know, um, nowadays, Decepticon drones are kind of a given, you know, because you have the uh, Transformers video game that came out with the Transformers movie in 07. Yeah. But back then, the, you know, drones, there was no such thing as drones. I was like, what are these? Why can't we have Seekers as drones? You know, wouldn't it make sense that there'd be a small army of uh, multicolored Seekers there? <laughs> that would have been much more cool. Yeah, it would have been cooler, but it wouldn't make any sense because the animators would have gotten all the color schemes wrong. That that's the beauty of it. That's how you end up with uh, Acid no, Storm no, 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 and Sunstorm. You no, know, no, no. I'm talking about like Starscream and his colors having Thundercracker's voice and vice versa. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Uh, that's that's fine too. That, that, that can be all. That can all be retconned. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Then the asteroid carrying the Combaticons arrives and sh- at Cyber- on Cybertron. Shockwave and his drones are defeated by Bruticus. The giant robot takes Shockwave, puts him in his cannon on his back, and shoots him uh, into deep space on uh, Earth. That, that's that's before I want to say uh, that was after uh, he picks up in gun mode and actually guns down all of the. Uh Oh, robots. well, that's why I said that, you know, Shockwave and his drones are defeated by Bruticus. And then well, techni- he... Technically, the drones are defeated by Shockwave. But, uh... <laughs> no, the, dr- the drones are Shockwaves. What? The drones. Oh, the drones aren't Shockwaves? Yes, the, the Cybertronian drones. Shockwave has control over them. Oh, granted. All right, yeah, fine. So they're, they're not exactly autonomous. Next but, time uh, you record with me, you are going to be sober, sir. <laughs> I am thoroughly sober, sir. <laughs> you know, I, I, I am, uh, you know, like I said, I'm fine. Yeah, I, I can drive. It's cool. Uh, but uh, the other thing I was going to mention was the fact that, that uh, when Bruticus is, is uh, you know, grabs a hold of Shockwave and picks him up and says, you know, you control the, the giant Sentinel robots. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, there's no giant sentinel robots here. There's just little shrimpy cone heads. Yeah, yeah, we don't Wouldn't see Wouldn't it be the... cool, though, if, if if Bruticus had to fight maybe a dozen, set, like, Omega Supremes in, in, in the blue and silver? Yeah. yeah. That would have been awesome. But, you know, again, with the uh, uh, animation errors. Yeah. yeah they um, would have all been the wrong color. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have cared. It still would have been cool. On Earth, the Insecticons and Decepticons are draining energy, and the Autobots arrive to stop their plan. However, the Insecticons have multiplied and are invading an, an inhabited neighborhood. Uh, the next bullet point says, The Autobots cannot fight them with all the humans around. At the, uh, the Autobot base, Perceptor is showing Spike the universe and explaining that it goes on forever and ever. Uh... This uh, this next part of the bullet point says uh, it, it should be noted as Spike and Perceptor are looking at this, it shows Shockwave is tumbling through space when he collides <laughs> into Starscream, yeah. and they attempt to team up to regain control of Cybertron from the Combaticons. Yeah, while you were looking over there at the uh, the Dog Star, did you happen to notice that <laughs> giant purple gun? Yeah, exactly. Floating through space. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, uh, uh, going back, I was going to say the uh, the Insecticons. First of all, I hate uh, Insecticon armies. 
Because it's like, you know, there should only be three, first of all, <laughs> and they shouldn't be able to multiply. Uh, you know, because first of all, it's it's kind of dumb. And second of all, the, the, you would think with an army that size, they could easily overtake the, the Autobots. Because the Septicons are always whining about, there's too many of them, we're being overrun. You have an m- army of Insecticons, and all they do is eat. I mean, they could land on the Autobots and just eat them. The thing that I find strange about all the different factions of Decepticons, whether those be Combiners, loyal, non-loyal, whether they be Insecticons, Predacons, whatever, Megatron, especially in G1, Megatron doesn't trust anyone other than, like, Soundwave and his little cassette deck things. Yeah, his immediate family. Uh, Yeah, Uh, I mean, so, you know, the Insecticons, I really don't care for myself. I actually, one of my very first, which I no longer have, which I don't even care to have, one of my very first first Transformers toys when I was a kid was Bombshell. I thought Bombshell was cool as hell. The, it, yeah, well, no, they're very cool characters. Yeah. But but again, the army there should is only the problem. be three. Yes. Yeah, exactly. if there was just three of them, I'd be okay, but there's the animation shows, like, dozens yeah. floating through the air. Yeah, I know. And then uh, they have to evacuate the humans, and Optimus Prime says... You know, protector bots, get out here and help us. Yep. And they're all hanging out in a garage. <laughs> they just drive out of the garage. Hi. This is also Ooh. another uh, <laughs> instance of where the fuck do the protector bots come from? According to <laughs> according to the key to Vector Sigma, you have yeah. to go there. I mean, anybody can build robots, but in order for them to get cybernetic personalities, you have to go to the to, to Vector Sigma for them to get it. So where the hell do the protector bots come, come from? Yeah, I don't have any idea. Um, See, for some reason, I was thinking that the Matrix of Leadership could bestow. It wasn't life. Ma- the Matrix wasn't introduced yet. Well, no, it wasn't considered the Matrix until the movie. But it was the fact that that Optimus Prime, because he was Prime, he was he was able to do that. No, and I'm not even going to go with uh, last week's episode and the Primer Prime. We're not even going to go there. <laughs> You just made that thank, up. Thank no, I God. Didn't. <laughs> thank God. In the, now you're just being contradictory. In, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. In, <laughs> in the episode of Prime Problem, when Megatron clones Optimus, thank God they did not use it in that, because that would just be so cheesy. Oh, yeah. Lord. Um, on Cybertron, the Combaticons <laughs> realize that the Decepticon technology has advanced so much since their imprisonment, Spike and Perceptor reach Prime and inform him that the energy signals coming from Cybertron show that Earth's orbit has been altered and it is heading straight for the sun. Uh, can anybody say Megatron's master plan? <laughs> How many times are we going to do this? you think by now we would have built heat shields around the whole damn planet. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> this marks the second time, as far as I know, that s- some evildoer, whether it be Metron and the rest of the Decepticons, or some Renegades, or Insecticons, whatever have you, that try to send either the Autobots or the Earth into the Sun. Well, it's either that, or heat up the Sun, or explode the Sun, thus baking the Earth just as much. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Or bringing Cybertron into Earth's orbit, creating all kinds of... You know, storms. They well, only did that once. Well, yeah, they only did it once, but actually, they do it. T- well, they don't show the effects of Earth, but it's something I've noticed throughout the series. If you look at that, if you look at that episode, The Ultimate Doom, and you look at Rebirth, exact same thing. Me- uh. Megatron in The Ultimate Doom is going to bring Cybertron to into Earth's orbit. Galvatron in Rebirth takes builds a rocket onto Cybertron and shoots the planet to Earth. Okay. But anyway, I digress. The Autobots yeah. head for the space bridge, but Megatron has the Insecticons steal the space bridge controller and escape with it. Back on Cybertron, Shockwave and Starscream have tricked the Combaticons with the holographic projector. Well, I actually used a holographic projector. Anyway. Um, yeah. yeah. You figured out how to spell it. Yeah, time. really. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but they uh, they actually you know run out of energy fighting the fake uh, holographic yeah they, holographically projected enemies yes they do um, they retake the transport chamber but Shockwave finds out that the space bridge receiver has been altered to send the Earth into the sun 
Shockwave attempts to correct this issue, but Starscream blasts him. He also attempts to uh, uh, contact Megatron, and that's why Starscream blasts him. Um, on Earth, the Autobots are still looking for the bridge control. When Star- Wait, when's- why does... Oh, that's right. L- later in the episode. Starscream calls Megatron and uh, issues him an ultimatum. This is when Starscream still has the upper hand. Yes, exactly. Okay, I remember that now. It's, it's yeah. been a while. Uh, <laughs> on Cybertron, the Combaticons realize that they've been had. Yeah, this like I said, right, right when they decide that, Starscream <laughs> loses his upper hand. Yes, exactly, and they go all berserker. <laughs> yes, that was a Clerks reference. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, my love is <laughs> like a berserker. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to be <laughs> great? Did he just say making fuck? I think yes, that's what he said. He said making fuck. The Autobots <laughs> The Autobots and Decepticons on Earth realize that they'll have to work together in order to stop Starscream and the Combaticons. Once on Cybertron, the combined efforts uh, efforts of the warring factions release Starscream and Shockwave, but the Combaticons come in and demand that Starscream is their prisoner. A battle begins and Starscream tells Optimus Prime of the three spots on Bruticus's back that will deactivate him. Thus beginning the lies. Because, and I will get into this at the very end of the episode, because it it is shown that uh, Starscream somehow devises a plan to trick the Autobots uh, into believing that Bruticus is, is deactivated. Now, maybe, possibly, when Optimus shoots the three things, maybe it paralyzes him. Kind of like uh, the only... Um, only Comparison I can think of is when uh, Obadiah Stane uses that little paralyzer gadget on Tony and Iron Man. Uh, but obviously Optimus wasn't that close. It, it, to, to completely geek out here, it might be the equivalent of the Vulcan nerve pain. <laughs> oh my god. You got uh, <laughs> drops. You start. You kind of drools a little bit. You <laughs> fucking Trekkie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, please. Like, you've never watched Star Trek. Uh, I've uh, watched, you, you knew what it I've was. Wa- oh, I know what it was, but it's I'm not like one of these <laughs> obsessed fans. I actually was staying a weekend at a foster home when I was younger, and uh, the foster father was a huge, like, one of these, oh, my God, I can't, you know, mint in box, and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, I only touched the box, and it didn't even move. I just touched it to look at it. It wasn't like I was opening the fucking thing. Anyway. You got you got finger grease on yeah, it. Really. Yeah, really. Yeah, ain't that yeah, the truth. Yeah. It, I can relate. It, yeah. it destroyed its, like, <laughs> like 4000 of its $10,000 value. Uh, oh, anyway. That's terrible. The Earth is saved, yeah. and Prime says that Bruticus is a menace to both Autobots and Decepticons. Megatron has Starscream destroy him, or so it would seem... The episodes with the Autobots return. Uh, the episode. Wait, what the hell? It ends with the Autobots. Ah, uh, stupid freaking keyboard. The episode ends with the Autobots returning to Earth and Megatron praising Starscream for his plan to allow the Autobots to think that Bruticus has been destroyed. Because Starscream used the holograph- holographic projector yep. to make it look like he was blown up. Yep. Mm. When in fact they were. Con- and Megatron. Er, Megatron uh, Optimus Prime is remarking on the way out the door. Well, Megatron was awful nice about uh, showing us the way out and not having the door smack us in the ass as we were leaving. That's because they were hiding yeah. uh, Bruticus behind the uh, the curtain there. Yep. Pay no attention to the giant mega combiner robot gestalt thingy behind the curtain. Yep. Thus ending this episode. Now, for our thoughts on this episode... Uh, for me, there really isn't a lot of notes. Uh, I actually should mention I forgot about the last bullet point in the synopsis, which says, Megatron tells Starscream that he may return to Earth as his subordinate, and they will rebuild Bruticus to obey only Megatron. And actually has his head pulled open. So that yes, it does. His brain pan mm-hmm. exposed. As, yeah. uh, so that they can, uh, you know, reprogram him to only obey Megatron. Yes, exactly. Um, I liked the ending to the episode. It shows, once again, how underhanded and sneaky the Decepticons really are. I just can't get past the continuity error. That that really is bugging me. That has got to be my biggest gripe about this kind of two-parter episode, especially when you've already previewed them in a previous one that they weren't even built yet. 
So what about you? Well, I, I kind of, you know, dig Starscream's mentality when, when uh, he's like, I'm just going to send the entire planet to the sun. And, you know, Shockwave says, well, Megatron's on it. And Starscream says, cool. <laughs> you know, that's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So he calls Megatron and says, uh, you know, I'm just going to send you and everybody else hurtling into the sun if that's cool. You know, and Megatron's like, no, no, you don't. And, and but, but the clincher here is when Starscream says, you know, I'm going to rule the universe, and I don't care if I'm the only one in it. <laughs> it's going to happen, buddy. Yeah. Uh, but that, that to me, kind of sums it up for Starscream. Yeah. Which is why it's so, you know, so uh, anticlimactic at the end when Megatron turns to Starscream and says, we're going back to Earth, and you're going to be my bitch. And Starscream yeah, thanks him for it. Yes, basically. Um, it should be noted that the sending Earth into the sun thing was not Starscream's idea, though. It was on the... That's how the Combaticons were going to get rid of Megatron, the Autobots, and the entire planet. And they're, yeah, because they're, they're on the revenge list. And Yeah, and they're on the revenge list, they're and Starscream revenge. just took credit for it. Well, you know, it kind of fit in. You know, he's thinking... Uh, I could do without a planet, and if Megatron's <laughs> on it, pff, all the better. <laughs> you know? Exactly. It works for me. But yeah, that, yeah. that really summed up uh, Starscream for me in a, in a nutshell of that episode. Yeah, Starscream is one of those very clear-cut characters. There's no depth to him whatsoever. Um, and you you know what he's about. He's about being, like, like I've said in several of the descriptions, a sniveling little Decepticon. That's all he is. He wants what he wants when he wants it and he attempts stupidly to go after it most of the time and he ends up at the end of the giant fusion cannon <laughs> at the wrong end of a giant fusion yes, cannon yes at the wrong end of the giant fusion cannon <laughs> <That's> right <laughs> all right on to the next episode Thomas, check out the tv news that guy there works at the optics plant those stunticons raided and at first i thought those driverless cars were autobots Wild, huh, Optimus? Stunticons mistake it for Autobots? Yes, and it's given me an idea. I hope this camouflage paint comes off, Jazz. Oh, quit griping. You're still the same side swipe inside, right? How do I look, Ratchet? Your own designer wouldn't know you, Windcharger. Man, Optimus, you're a dead ringer for Motormaster. Did you have to say dead ringer, Spike? They're ready, Optimus. The new Stunticons. Breakdown, alias Sideswipe. Dead End, alias Jazz. Wild Rider, alias Windcharger. And Dragstrip? Dragstrip? A.K.A. Mirage. One stolen ruby and red, wasn't it? Okay, then we're ready. But remember, the success of this mission depends on absolute secrecy. Under no circumstances must you follow us or break radio silence. Understood? Yeah, but I don't have to like it. All right, then. Uh, Stunticons, let's roll for it. <laughs> map that crater is less than a mile away. Can't get there too soon for me. Me too, Windcharger. I'm anxious to dent some Decepticon metal. From now on, I suggest we call each other by our assumed names, Breakdown. Cool it, we got company. Laser beak. Let's test our disguises on him. <laughs> Laserbeak didn't attack, so maybe we fooled him. But the real trick is fooling Megatron. I don't like being a studded con. Hey man, zip that lip! Isn't it, Megatron? How safely the Stunticons drive today? So as not to damage their stolen cargo, Starscream. Perhaps. Have your Stunticons brought all the components, Motormaster? Hey, 
what I let you down? Something wrong with your vocalizer, Motormaster? You sound strained. Um, too much to sound, I guess. What of the other components? We got them all, Megatron! are in place, and the weapon but minutes from completion, and then... <laughs> and then what? What was all that noise? Great Cybertron! Looks like an earthquake hit him! Yeah, Spike. And judging from those empty cells, it was an earthquake named Menasaur. Disaster. We'll be fine. It is complete. The most destructive weapon known to Decepticon science. Constructicons, you are dismissed. <laughs> Next is Masquerade, and according to the little booklet, it says, Megatron is assembling a new device and sends the Stunticons out to procure the needed parts. Learning of these missions, Optimus Prime, Windcharger, Mirage, Jazz, and Sideswipe intercept the Stunticons and imprison them in the Ark. The Autobots disguise themselves as the Stunticons to discover and thwart Megatron's plans. And Michael is going to be taking over the synopsis that I wrote, so he can butcher it as much as he wants. I really don't care. <laughs> I got free reign. Yes. Carte blanche. Yes, okay. exactly. 
Okay, so we'll begin the episode with Megatron sending the Stunticons out to retrieve three components to build some sort of weapon. They don't actually say what kind of weapon it is, they just send them out there. Uh, and Starscream even remarks, Are you sure it's not a good idea to send these guys out there? Because they really don't know their own ass from a hole in the ground. And Megatron says they have very unique configurations, so they're the guys. Uh, you have anything to th- say about the, the the initial plot line? No, not really. There, it's just... Um, I'll have more to say once we... Get into it? Well, yeah, once we get into it, because I'm I'm reading it through it as it, you're as you're uh, okay breaking it down. Okay, so uh, basically we have the uh, the Autobots uh, see the Stunticons. They say, oh well, you know we have five Decepticons going at ground level. Bingo, it's Decepticons or Stunticons. Yeah, and they head out to stop uh, whatever that they are doing. Yep, pretty much. That's, um, that's... Hoist and grapple, I swear. Uh, be- between hoist and grapple and red alert and inferno. I don't know if you listened to my other episode when it was a while back. They are the four gay G1 characters. <laughs> I swear to God. You see, at this point, they've run out of voices. You know, they they <laughs> they, they, they try different characters. Voices, you know, you've got Casey Kasem and you've got uh, uh, Dan Gil- Gilvazan, yeah. and you know uh, Colin doing doing Prime and I Hyde, and and they sound enough a lot different where you know you can tell them apart. But by the time you get to forty characters, forty Autobots or so, you got to go with inflections or uh, you know ca- key phrases, catchphrases like Warpath, Boom, Zam, Pow. Yeah. Because at that point they all start to sound the same, yeah, and if they you do. didn't have some with a gay lisp, you know, then, then you wouldn't understand who's who. I'm not even talking about the voices being gay. I'm talking about the actual characters, just the way that they come off. Oh, I thought it was just their their no, voices. No, not no, 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 not the voices, not at all the voices, the characters themselves. Um, but anyway, the basic plot of this is that the Stunticons are captured by the Autobots. And the Autobots have Jazz has this cool kind of paint thing, and Sunstreaker's like, "Oh, it's not gonna mess up my beautiful chassis, is it?" No, it washes <laughs> right off, you know. And uh, you're uh, passing up the most epic uh, part, which would be wow. <laughs> when the Autobots, you know, they split up in their special teams, uh, which is is pretty much uh, you know a, a rather large toy commercial mm-hmm. because they introduce all these different. Uh, maybe not introduced, but they bring in out a lot of different characters. Uh, but they catch everybody, but Optimus gets Motormaster. Yeah. And the way that, the way he does it is awesome. Yeah, I mean, just pl- playing chicken. Well, <laughs> but yeah, I guess it's playing chicken. But I mean, it's like this huge epic head-on collision where it's fire, smoke, brimstone. Nobody can see what's going on. Everyone's wondering if Prime is dead. You know Prime's not dead. But the fact that it's like, oh, he could be, you know, and then they they draw it out for about a minute. Just wait uh, another year; he'll be dead. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> the smoke is cleared, and oh, he's in black oh, no. and white. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Daniel cries. Oh. Anyway. Oh, right. anyway, so so yeah, but Optimus wins. Yeah. And uh, you know, for me, that especially as a little kid, how cool was that? It's oh like, yeah! Fuck yeah! Optimus Prime won. He kicked his ass. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but yeah. So, so suffice to say, Stunicons are captured, and uh, the the Autobots get this great idea that they are going to disguise themselves as the Stunicons uh, in order to figure out what uh, Megatron is actually up to. Because they have these pieces of this weapon, yeah. but they don't really know what it's for. Yep. So the so they head to the to this crater where the Decepticons are hiding. And the the Constructicons are, are there building this the super weapon, um, as uh, you know, Prime and the crew drive up. Uh, but they they never bother to see you know exactly. Well, they they're all fools. What it comes down to, they they don't say what's the password. Well, well there is no password. Security <laughs> is so lax that this group of you know poorly descri- uh, disguised uh, Autobots just drives into their base. Well, I do have to say that the paint and all that stuff and the change over from their original molds to the the impersonation colors 
it was pretty much spot on. And out of all of the Decepticons, the only one that voices concern is Starscream. He actually yeah. says that, you know... He was the smart one this time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Probably the only time in the entire series. Well, whatever. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, no, he is, the, he is smart. He was a scientist. Yeah. 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 And he, he, uh, he's never one to uh, not tell everybody that he, he's the smart one. Yes, exactly. Um, so long story short, uh, the, the, I was going to say the Constructa Stunta, I don't know what the hell I was going to say. Well, the Constructicons left, the Sonicons are there, Yeah. Uh, the fake Sonicons are there, and suddenly the, the real Sonicons show up. And they both merge. Now, and they, <laughs> I have they a problem merge. with, if this is supposed to be just paint on the Autobots, how the hell can they merge? Big Magnets. <laughs> yeah, big mag. Yeah, they're holding on for dear life. You know, uh, you realize if you don't hold on really tight, we're all gonna die. I'm holding on, man. <laughs> I'm hanging on the best I can. And then it, and, and then Soundwave pipes up and says, "Real, real Minosaur has special powers. We never knew anything about real Minosaur having special powers. powers. Yeah. And what he brings out is a big fucking sword." Oh, give me a no, break. No, no, I think he, he shot him with his underarm cannons. <laughs> his, yeah. They his forearm killed him. cannons. His <laughs> underarm makes it sound like missiles. <laughs> they, they, they killed him with B.O. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like, P.U. Okay, all right, we give up. All right, we give up. And, uh, you know, they probably, the Autobots, once they uh, were found out, you know, they probably would have had their asses handed them. But uh, they had reinforcements showing up. And yep. once again... You know, Megatron and crew uh, decide that they are outnumbered. And well, Menasaur in particular, you mean, you think with Menasaur there and the Constructicons not too far away at that point, that it would have been fairly easy for them to gang up on, on uh, you know, the, the entire Autobot army and just waste them right there. Didn't Megatron and the rest of the Decepticons leave Menasaur to deal with them? And then Menasaur said, oh no, you're not leaving me, and then he flies off. Uh, I didn't really catch it that way, but maybe. I thought that's what happened. I don't know. I'd have to go back and watch it, and I'm too lazy for that right now. Well, <laughs> well still, uh, when the uh, when the Autobots do disassemble, they they pretty much pour everything they've got into Menasaur. Oh even, yeah. Even the, uh, the 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 shoulder missiles are are firing, and uh, nothing is doing any good against Menasaur. So I'm thinking, you know, he probably could have taken them. Yeah, you probably could have. Yeah. Well, even with the even with the reinforcements. Yeah, probably. But regardless, see, this would have been a good thing uh, to introduce those Decepticon clones. Oh, the cone heads. Yeah, that, that's it's like true. well, yeah. See, now we're not uh, outmatched. Now, now we've got a small army of of cone heads, and <laughs> we're just gonna take. The, we're gonna call it right here. We're gonna right here and now. <laughs> yep. So that pretty much ends the synopsis for this episode. Now for our thoughts on this episode. This was very cool seeing the Autobots disguised as Decepticons. Not sure if that has happened before this episode, which I don't think it has. Um, I remember the Decepticons disguised themselves as the Autobots in Megatron's Master Plan. But it is nice seeing the Autobots thinking outside the box... Uh, there was one animation flub I noticed at the end where Starscream and Soundwave retreat. Soundwave transforms into his tape deck mode and flies next to Starscream. What the fuck? That has never happened before. Anytime you see Soundwave... So- Soundwave. Sound- that would be Soundwave's sound- wife. So- yeah, really. Yeah, she's got a really so- huge tape deck. Uh, let's not even go there. <laughs> Dirty old man, let's she's not even go there. Dirt- Let's not even go there. Eh, We're not going there. Eh, We can edit that out in post, right? No. (laughs) No, we don't edit anything over here. We leave it all in. We let it hang all out. It's like like, uh, Jim Carrey said in uh, Liar Liar. How's it hanging? Short, shriveled, noise to left. (laughs) But um, you never see in the entire series any time that Soundwave is flying, whether he's flying next to Megatron, whether he's flying next to Dirge, Astro Train, whatever. He's always you in robot never, mode. He's always in robot mode. You never see him in tape deck mode. Never. 
unless he's on top of somebody. Like if like if if uh, Starscream is flying at level, and Soundwave is in tape deck mode, sitting on top of the jet. Yeah, maybe that perched I, on there, getting around. that. I that I can believe, but yeah. a flying tape deck. I don't fucking think so. Not so much. No, no not so much. So, what are your thoughts on this episode? Uh, I kind of dig it. Um, I mean, I like the, I like the whole premise. Uh, what I was wondering is, why wouldn't at, at some point Megatron try the same thing? I mean, literally, you've got Superion, uh, the aerial bots, right? And right. and they're they're the best flyers that the Autobots have, but the uh, the Decepticon army has plenty of Seekers that they could easily just repaint and make them look like the aerial bots and then wander in, you know, directly into their camp. That yeah. would be, I mean, I think that would be really cool. Honestly, yeah, what would be that's... really neat is to see some kit bashers uh, take <laughs> the uh, a Superion, and maybe an older one, and maybe even a newer one like an Energon a Superion, Superion Maximus, you know, and repaint him into uh, Seeker colors. Repaint the limbs into Seeker colors. I mean, that would be really neat. That's, that would be a really cool thing I'd like to see. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I actually think, I'm trying to remember what episode it was. There was an episode where in earlier, earlier, either in season one or season, earlier in season two, I forget, um, that Ironhide and a whole bunch of other Autobots have to go to Cybertron, and Megatron is going to hurt them with acid rain because apparently apparently acid corrodes the auto only the autobots and they have like three cybertronian jets one is white one is red and one is green and i made a note in that episode Uh, are these three the future cybertronian molds of dirge thrust and ramjet because that's the other thing you never see where Dirge thrust and ramjet come from. Right. Never see, never well, see that. Actually, the uh, the green one was acid rain, or acid storm. I think oh, originally okay. uh, at a botcon they they mentioned that they wanted to name him uh, acid rain or something like that, but uh, they ended up with the name acid storm. Oh, okay. As the green one, or the, the uh, yeah, it was uh, transformer the, the the classics line. They they had a a, a green seeker. Oh, okay. Well, it, was named I, I don't know. it was supposed to have been that one from that particular episode. Uh huh. You have any more thoughts on Masquerade? Actually, no. I, I think I've uh, diverged enough from the topic. Thanks. All right. <laughs> on to the last episode. Let's go. You know what we ought to do for the science project? What? Build our, our own robot. Yeah. Whose idea was it to look for parts in the dump? Uh, well, we can't afford to buy parts, and there's lots of perfectly good junk here, so I think that... Save it. But look at this! I bet this is good for something. I don't know what just yet, but... What's going to happen if they catch us? We're going to be expelled. I'm still not too sure we can do it. Hey, guys, I got a name. I call it a Biotronic Operational Telecommunicator, which pretty much describes its function. If you say so. If you take the first letter of each word, you get bot. Also short for robot, bot. And this will be the final episode of Season 2, the very anticlimactic bot. Uh, to synopsize this episode, in a battle with Defensor, four out of the five Combaticons are damaged and Swindle sells off their parts. A group of high school students get Brawl's personality component and install it in their science project robot called Bot. And it's like biometric, optotronic, I don't even remember uh, what it... Telecommunications, bio... Mm, biometric... Optical telecommunication, something or other. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember either. I, I do know that it uh, uh, bears an uncanny resemblance to the Beast Wars Neo uh, Unicron toy. <laughs> if you're familiar with that, you know. I've seen pictures. He's just a big round ball. But what, what kills <laughs> me is that the, the high school students uh, are, are the two Corys yep. of 80s fame. Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. Yep. I can't prove it. I'm sure they didn't get paid royalties for this, but uh, you look at them, and you know the one Corey has 
the, the this horrible rictus grin plastered onto his face the entire episode, and the yeah. other one has this horrible mullet looking thing, and you know it, you know, you know, you know it's Haim. Yeah, I think the only thing that I've seen either one of them in, um, I actually have the DVD of it. Uh, Corey Haim was in a movie called Double O Kid. And that is the only thing I've seen him in, and it's the only thing I will ever own of theirs on on out of either one of them on DVD. Well, that's because you don't like scary movies. You know, you go back far enough into the uh, uh, Friday the Thirteenth line, and you end up—I I believe it was Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman as um, uh, I forget his name, but but uh, some kid who ends up in uh, several episodes. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, so let's see. In, and the in Lost search- Boys. And, yeah, the Lost Boys. No yeah. Lost Boys in this episode. Whatever. Yeah, no. But to, di- but to digress, I'm sorry. <laughs> to make it, yeah, to make a long story short, the Autobots need to stop the, the, ro- the, the robot that the kids have made before it destroys the school. In searching for the missing part to the Combaticons, Megatron put a bomb in Swindle's head that will explode in 15 hours. Unless he can get the Combaticons rebuilt and merge into Bruticus, Meta- uh, Metatron. What the hell is a Meta? That is from freaking Dogma. Jesus Christ, Kevin Smith on the brain. Hello. <laughs> Megatron's plan in this episode is to blast the moon out of the sky so that the Decepticons can control the oceans of the Earth. Uh, okay. Uh, That's what that was for. Oh. Yes. The kids listen to Brawl's communicator and find out about the Decepticon plan, and then they warn the Autobots who call in the Protectobots. Yeah, that's yeah. what kills me, though, is the fact that, you know, you basically have these kids, and they're they're digging through the garbage dump yep. for uh, junk that they can build their robot with, and they end up finding, you know, Brawl's personality component, which <laughs> looks like, you know... Uh, a, uh, a touring device or something, um, uh, an Enigma de- machine, you know, from World War II, kind of. Except with all, yeah. all, all the keys. You know, I don't think we we covered uh, how exactly the, the pieces ended up in. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, the Combaticons were damaged, and Swindle sells off the parts. Well, yes, yeah, Swindle sells off the parts, and to, somehow to the Transylvanian general. Yeah. Or the Carbomia General, whichever see, you prefer. Let's see, let's see later on, the, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead here, but when he actually has to retrieve the parts, uh, Swindle yeah. uh, attacks the Russian army. Yeah, that 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 is true. So it's like, uh, are they Russians? Are they Transylvanians? Are they Carbomians? They're yeah. foreigners. I thought Carbomia was more Middle East, whereas this was definitely somewhere snowy like Siberia. Yeah, it could be. Plus, I think Carbomia comes in... Um, Actually, it came in in an episode earlier this season, but it also comes more into play in season three. A car bomb. You would never get away with that nowadays. Mm, no, not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the kids are in the Autobot headquarters. They use Teletran 1 to gain control of the Decepticon weapon and fire it upon them, causing them to retreat. After the battle is over, the girl that helped out with the other two boys asks them for spare parts. <sighs> So they can build another robot, to which the boys grab some duct tape, put it over her mouth, and leave the base. Thus ending the final episode of Season 2. Because there's always duct tape available. A thousand and one uses. Especially in a base with giant fucking (laughs) robots. Because that's what Ratchet uses to repair the giant fucking robots. Exactly. We got duct tape tape, don't we? Ah, here we go. Sorry about this. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to duct tape your voice box back. I hope that works for you. You'll probably not be able to speak except through, you know, radio chatter, but the duct tape you know, works in 99.9% of the cases. Oh my god, that's funny. Sorry about that. Uh, right. But, but yeah. uh, oh, you know what? I wanted to bring something else up about the, uh, the kids. The kids, you know, basically are the most annoying part of this episode and pretty much any other episode where you have humans involved. But um, I guess we can... Uh, I'll cover that later. Under, yeah, under the, our uh, thoughts. Yes. So we are going to go on to our thoughts. Uh, now for our thoughts on this episode. Um, as I said in the very beginning of the synopsis, this was a very anticlimactic season ender. 
at least with Heavy Metal War in Season 1, we got some suspense as if the Decepticons would return or not. Um, or, I should say, when they would return. But this just, well, sucked balls, to quote Birdman Dodd. Um, it reminded me of Autobot Spike, the episode that actually began Season 2, uh, which I hated that episode. <laughs> uh, borrowed heavily There's... from some classic American literature. Well... And film. <laughs> Franken Frankenstein. Yeah, exactly. I just... I... Didn't like this episode. I wish, I wish that they would have... Well, besides that, I wish that they would have thought more to the point of, hey, we have a movie coming up. We're going to be doing a movie in between a season set. So let's put a little spin on it. If they had added... The scramble. If they had actually Americanized the Scramble City J- Japanese episode, introducing Ultra Magnus and all of them, oh. if they had kind of tied it in, yeah, a little bit. I mean, you end season two on such a very bad fucking note, right? To the point where you don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> and then you open the movie with Unicron and I forget what they f- were freaking called. One of them was called Cranix. Cranix. Yeah. On, on some strange planet. Yeah. Ubelus. Yeah. Yeah. Ubelus. <laughs> yeah. Ubelus, it's Unicron! <laughs> help, help me! It's help like, me, it's like, oh, fuck, I knew he was coming this multi- way, but, yeah. No. Uh, help me save my multicolored Bunsen burners, <laughs> for Christ's sake. Yeah, to, but we'll get into that. To in digress, so I don't, just, I'm not entirely yeah. certain that these episodes were in the right order to begin with. Uh, I think maybe they were... Uh, you know, kind of recorded in one order and then showed on TV in a different order. Uh, that could be. Because, well, you, you mentioned before how uh, uh, Bruticus. Bruticus was introduced in an earlier episode, and it's entirely possible maybe that episode was the one that was supposed to be the season ender, and they it just got flip flopped. It could have been. I mean, I'm sure somebody but... knows out there. I, I, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm just yeah, postulating. I, I don't know either. I just know that, especially with a lot of the. Um, Again, going back to my inspiration to even start the TFG1 podcast was a podcast I listened to called World's Finest Podcast, which is Big uh, plug. Michael. De- yeah, well, plug it's plug. a plug, but I plug them all the time. So, <laughs> I mean, my sockets are filled with plugs from <laughs> Earth 2net and yeah, let's not even go. It's just a. That sounds dirty. Yeah, yeah shut up. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> the point is they go by production order because it's easier for them. Right. Well, when I looked at the cartoons on the DVDs, I said, okay, well, this is how they're listed. I broke them up into either four or five or six episodes per podcast episode, depending on, you know, where the... I broke them up basically on the two to five part story. Mm-hmm. I, did, I didn't want a two-parter split up between podcast episodes. So that's how I broke them up, and that's how it kind of seems like they were um, out of context or whatever but i but i mean they're still in production up. order though yeah, regardless of where I... you split between the episodes yeah. for podcast purposes oh, oh yeah yeah but yeah. i'm just saying that you know it's entirely possible that maybe in japan uh bot came before cosmic rust um aerial assault is where the the flub is aerial assault has the combaticons not cosmic rust well that yeah that too I'm saying Bot could have been anywhere. It may not have been the last episode. Maybe that was just yeah. how it ended up being. But for this, for the U.S. set, and for this being, that's that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, granted. I just thought it was fucked up. It is. So what are your, th- what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I had a lot of thoughts. Um, you know, starting with, uh, you know, the beginning of the episode, you've, you, they basically say... Uh, in a fight against Defensor and the Combaticons, as badass as the Combaticons are, Defensor kills him with one shot. Just, hey, there he is in the middle of the road. He's dead. And then, <laughs> and then as he walks off, he kind of remarks over his shoulder, you know, call the streets in sand and tell them there's shit in the road. They, you know, they gotta come pick it up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, it's too bad that these episodes are so, you know, short and tight, you know, because... This battle could have been easily five, ten minutes. They could have rustled around and knocked some buildings over, you know, uh, Gojira style. But but it's just one shot. Psh, okay, boom, he's dead. Well, that was easy. Yeah, clean this shit up. Yeah. Uh, that I, you know, and granted, it's nice to see Swindle 
crawling out of the rubble and saying, "Ooh, I'm going to make some money." Yeah, but Swindle, <laughs> Swindle says, "Where his? I think his exact words were, where am I going to get all the spare parts to rebuild these guys?'" And in the end, he doesn't go out to find spare parts. He he literally sells all the parts off. You know, so I think I'm, I'm not sure if it was somewhere lost in the plot line, but yeah, you know, I think Swindle at one point intended to uh, rebuild his his uh, his buddies so that they could you know fight another day. I seriously doubt that because of his nature. <laughs> No, seriously. Yeah. I seriously doubt that because of his nature because if you look at how the if you look at how the episode progresses, yeah. he doesn't, doesn't even give it a second feel thought. The least he, bit bad about it. Not until they he put doesn't a bomb give it, in his head. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, uh, what do you regret what you've done? Well, I regret having a bomb in my head. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Now I feel kind of exactly. crappy about it. And the whole time for the rest of the episode, you can hear it ticking. He's he's like the crocodile. He tick tick Dick, dick, dick. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, they're gonna bomb in my head. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, you hear something? Yeah, that's my fucking head. Yeah, but uh, the yeah. other point that that I wanted to make about this episode is is uh, the girl. Uh, you know, I kind of expected her to be a double agent the whole time because she's wearing uh, Constructicon green and Decepticon purple. <laughs> in this horrible, horrible, like, 80s get-up. I mean, the, 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 the two choreos are in horrible, horrible 80s get-ups as well. But she looks particularly bad. Uh, and it's like, look at her. She's wearing Decepticon colors. You know she's she's evil. But in, in the end, she's not so much evil. She's just arrogant. Because uh, the boys, even in the beginning, they're like, oh, please don't pair us up with her. Please don't pair us up with her. And they do, and the teacher was like, ha-ha, I'm screwing you guys by pairing you up with this nimwit. And at the end... You know, it's it's almost as if she has a uh, a redeeming moment because at the end she's like, "Yes, I can program this robot to fire the giant laser against its creators because I can do anything." Mm-hmm. And at the end, it, it it doesn't come across so much as her redeeming moment. It comes across as her saying, "I'm an arrogant bitch." Pretty much. It, yeah. Did it come across that way for you? Because that's kind of what I got out of it. See, now that you mention the fact that the guys could have basically been copied off the two Corys, I've been trying to, throughout your whole little speech there, <laughs> I've been trying... Well, no, I'm, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm saying throughout your... your, your my rant, my your thought, tribe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, my, my half-dead brain cells are trying to think of who the hell she could be as far as, like, an 80s-type brat pack yeah. model type of character. Yeah. Because at first, in the beginning of the episode, she wants nothing. She's, like, really skeptical. Oh, I don't know if we should do the Kind of like the, the geeky the nerd scientist. Yeah. Yeah, r- r- really big stick in the mud. And then she ends up being almost a, a bit t- almost to where the two guys... Yeah. Well, yeah, smarter than they are, but all three of them are fairly smart. I mean, they're all... Even though the guys try to act like jerks and jock types, they're all fairly smart because they even say... Uh, in the episode, the guys were like, oh, yeah, we can do this, and we can do that, and this, that, and the other thing, and everything else, and then, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know. It, but, yeah, she did kind of come off as a bitch at the end, and I'm glad they used the fucking duct tape. <laughs> Even if, e- even if we don't know where it came from. That's right. I pulled this duct tape out of my yeah. Does this duct tape smell funny to you? Yeah. <laughs> well, it oh, might just God. Hold. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's Ratchet's duct tape. That's what he used to uh, duct tape Bumblebee's voice box back in. Which is why you can only hear him through the radio. And what, this is going to lead into a giant Bay rant unless we just end it right here. So. Yeah, we need to end this. <laughs> Thanks, so. everybody. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> the Transformers will return after these messages. The TFG1 Podcast has all your 80s goodness with full coverage of the Generation 1 cartoon and beyond. This is Mike the Birdman Dodd saying live free or die hard and listen to this goddamn podcast. Are you a fan of Transformers? Yes. Then be sure to visit PredaconEmpire.com, your resource for Transformers media and more. Also, be sure to check out our podcast, All Things Transformers and the TFG1 Podcast. I'm Steve slash Megatron, inviting you to come join the fun on the shows and the forums. So be sure to visit PredaconEmpire.com for all your Transformers needs. Enter now. 
Coming soon from PrediconEmpire.com, the M-Wire Movies Week in Review. Steve slash Megatron and I, Michael Blanchard, will sit down every week to review one movie that either one of us have picked. It is a genre-spanning movie review podcast that will be weekly. Look for it on PrediconEmpire.com and iTunes coming soon. We now return to the Transformers. Alrighty, next time on the TFG1 podcast, Steve slash Megatron and I will be discussing season two of the G1 cartoon. We will be discussing the overall good or badness of the season, and I'll be talking about the looks of the box sets and what's included with them. Um, yeah, box sets, let's not even get into that. Uh, thank you for joining me on the TFG1 podcast. Uh, there are four ways to get in touch with me or leave feedback for the podcast. The first is that you can visit the PrediconEmpire.com forums and get all your Transformers discussion topics there. You should really do this, people. Do it now. Resistance is futile. The second is that you can follow me on Twitter. My name on there is TFG1 Podcast. Uh, Michael, would you like to give your Twitter out? Heck yeah. Um, my listeners? Twitter is uh, Pecan Court Michael. That's P E C A N C T M I C H A E L, and I pronounce it Pecan Court uh, because I, a long time ago used to live on a street called Pecan Court. But, I was uh, wondering about that. Yeah, that. yeah, it's abbreviated as C T. Because you know how hard it is to come up with a, a unique handle on AIM. <laughs> so it's like, well, I live on Pecan Court. Technically, I could be Pecan Court Michael, and that's that's what I went with years ago. Oh, okay. So it's Pecan CT Michael uh, on Twitter.com. Cool. The third is you can visit the earth-2.net forums. I have a thread over there for the podcast under the banter section. And the fourth is the email address, which is tfg1podcast at gmail.com. For now, I am Michael Blanchard with... Michael Wilson. Saying in the immortal words of Optimus Prime, transform and roll out, and thank you for listening. Until next time.